and these are in listen only mode. Hello, and welcome to Planting Habitat on Farms with Sam Earnshaw. I'm Katherine Spencer, the Regional Coast Manager for CAF um, here on the Central Coast, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. CAF is a nonprofit organization that has been advocating for California family farmers and sustainable agriculture since 1978. We are pleased to host Sam in this webinar to continue our long-term efforts of promoting habitat and conservation practices on family farms. Sam Earnshaw has been a pioneer in planting habitat on farms in California and has been recognized on the state, national, and international level for his work. Sam's worked for CAF from 1992 to 2011, where he planted over 300 miles of hedgerows, windbreaks, riparian plantings, grass waterways, and filter strips on California farms. He is also the author of Hedgerows for California Agriculture, a resource guide published by CAF and available as a free download from our website, www.caf.org. Today's presentation will show a diversity of projects focusing on established practices and Sam's lessons learned from 20 years of planting habitat on farms. The presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. You may type and submit questions using the blue box labeled questions in the toolbar on the right hand side of your screen. This presentation will also be recorded and available on the CAF website for future reference next week. We'd like to thank the Natural Resources Conservation Services, the Conservation Innovation Grant for supporting this webinar and for many other funders over the years who've supported CAF's work in habitat restoration. So without further ado, I'll turn things over to Sam and we'll get started. Good morning, um, I'm Sam Earnshaw and thank you Catherine for that introduction and so today we're going to go through some of the design techniques and issues of habitat planting on farms. Um, I'd like to just acknowledge and thank all the people over the years that I've worked with on this. Um, the farmers who we've worked with, the NRCS, the RCD, uh, John Anderson at Hedgerow Farms in winters, Bob Bug, who was an entomologist at Davis, who did a lot of work on the beneficial insects associated with these plants, and many others. Um, so it's been a good ride doing this uh, and learning. And um, so we all have heard about the Dust Bowl, and that this cloud of dust was actually went into Washington, D.C. on the day they were uh, authorizing the Soil Conservation Service. And um, what the conservation practices that we're doing have many functions, and, and soil erosion is one of them. Um, but I'm going to talk today about hedgerows, grass waterways, filter strips, riparian plantings, and windbreaks. And the functions of these, they're different on every farm, but they're, sometimes they're multiple functions, soil erosion control, weed control, beneficial insect habitat, pollinator habitat, wildlife habitat, non-point source water pollution reduction, air quality and dust control, barriers, riparian stabilization, windbreak and climate modification, aesthetic value, economic returns, and increase in local and regional biodiversity. So we're gonna look at hedgerows, uh, perennial grasses, uh, filter strips, and windbreaks and also talk a little bit about the involvement of school kids in these programs, which is really an excellent thing. Um, I'm sure many of us heard about and know about hedgerows in England, um, the, the diversity on the landscape, um, and just a picture of a classic British hedgerow. There's so many different uses they had for these, um, the ancient hedgerows, and if you think back to the slide that I had, that's kind of about the practices and functions that we do today, and it's, it's wider than this. Um, John Anderson in Winters um, was, is a real pioneer. He has hedgerow farms, and he, he started planting hedgerows and grass waterways all around Yolo County. Um, this is a hedgerow that, this is one of the first ones that we did in uh, San Juan Batista at Phil Foster's farm. And um, this is native, we use native California plants, but it just shows how tall and thick they can get in a short period of time. Um, so one of the important 
elements to this is to use a diversity of plants. The, there's the species of plants there on the left, left, and then there's the flowering periods from January to December on the top. And that way there's pollen and nectar available for these beneficial insects the full year. Um, and besides, they, besides pollen and nectar, they also use the plants for cover and just living and reproducing and everything. So, um, okay, so the plants that we use, we try to use plants that are adapted locally. Um, this is a, a life zone of California, one way of looking at some of the plant growth in, a, in our state, and um, they have these for all states, but you can see the elevation, rainfall, climate, and biota are factors that that um, determine what grows there. And if you can see around the, the uh, coast and the foothills of the Sierras is, a, is this transition up zone. And um, when I was in Los Angeles, a few years ago, I went to the Audubon Center and they had done a big native planting there. And it was interesting that they were using the same plants that we use up here in the Central Coast and in Northern California and in the foothills of the Sierras and on the valley floor too. It was like ceanothus, uh, coffee berry, uh, coyote brush, um, buckwheats. So, um, and we try to get plants, nurseries, there's a lot of nurseries in our area that do grow these native plants and they collect from watersheds. And if that's possible to do, it's really good to get as close to the watershed where you're planting. So I'm just going to show a few of our California native plants here that we use. There's many varieties of ceanothus. There's short ones, medium ones, tall ones. Coffee berry also has short varieties and tall varieties. Toyon is a, in the rose family, a very good plant for flowering. It flowers in May and June. Okay. Um, buckwheats, there are lots of different buckwheats. They have millions of flowers on them, good landing pads for the, the insects. And the green plant there on the left is a coyote brush, which is a great plant. It has um, many insect species associated with it. It's, it's in the, actually in the sunflower family, and it's got male and female forms. Um, here's some plants that we use, and in the hedgerow manual, there's um, a species list in the back. That manual, as Catherine said, is a available free on the CAF website, and um, we, we're always adding to our species list, but there's many, many plants that can be used. Elderberry is a really good plant. It's very, very adaptable to both wet and dry situations. Uh, lizard tail or woolly sunflower. Um, black sage. There are many different sages. Salvia, which are great bee plants. And this is a good strong plant. Quail bush, salt bush, uh, Atriplex lentiformis. It grows in wet dry, hot, cold areas. It's a very adaptable plant, very fast growing. Here's a picture of it being used in the desert near down in Kern County. Um, and I just thought interesting that that slide on the left shows that, that when they were using it down there, they didn't plant it in continuous clumps out in the middle. They would leave openings so that the wildlife could have some visibility and not get picked off by predators. Just another aspect to some of this. So what we're going to do is look at some of the areas where you can put hedgerows. Along roads is a great area where a lot of times these are just weed patches and they have to be maintained. Um, farm edges, along fences. Um, and there's different styles of hedgerows. This is a double hedgerow. Both of these are at Live Earth Farm, Tom Brose's farm, but this was a double hedgerow and a transition from this woodland on the right over into the cropland on the left. Down below is actually a, tr a three row hedgerow. Um, and these hedgerows create habitat. This was one that we did in Fireball and the slide up on the left you can see um, is a pretty barren site. It's a it's an organic cotton farm but there's also almonds around and the farmer wanted to 
bring diversity in, and they'd been using annual uh, insect replantings with sunflowers and various other annuals, and they wanted a perennial. So basically, we created habitat here, and one of the scouts who was looking at the insects found a coyote and who made a den underneath the coyote brush. And then when he was crawling around under there, a gopher snake came out and scared the heck out of him. So, but you can see on the left, you wouldn't have a coyote or a gopher snake or any other. So creating habitat is actually one of the functions of these, and it really does work. Here's a coyote near one of the hedgerows that we had up at Tom Brose's. So, um, Planning a, high, a hedgerow is very precise and scientific. No, I'm just kidding here because there's a lot of variation. Every site is different, but these are some of the techniques that we use when we do a hedgerow. Like um, the, the slide on the bottom right shows a bed, and this is very important to not try to plant on flat ground. We get much better um, response from the plants when they actually are up on a bed. This this slide here could be the most important slide in the whole show, showing how high this berm was. Um, those plants actually did really, really well. And um, so the higher you can get a bed or a berm, the, the better it's going to be for the plants. This also kind of shows our irrigation system. We're using these um, inline drip tubing that you can get now. When we first were working, we'd be actually going around putting emitters in at each plant, but now this inline tubing is very inexpensive and it's great. You can get it at any spacing you want. You just pre-order it at five foot, four foot, six foot, three foot. So, um, and it's really good. Um, so just running through a planting here, starting with the bare soil, making a little bed there and laying out the, laying out the plants. Um, a lot of times we'll, most of the time actually, we'll run the irrigation system first get the plants wet. We actually didn't do that in this situation because you'll see in a minute we had a different watering thing, but we'd like to put a shovel full of compost in every hole when we when we do the planting. So we went and got some really good compost for this. Um, this was an almond farmer who had this wand, which was really, you can see on the left, if you can see, it's got little water coming out and we would just stick it down. But normally what we'll do is dig a hole and pour up, either have a hose and fill the hole up or put a five gallon bucket of water in it to really get that plant off to a good wet start. And then the drip takes over from there. And this just shows how these plants can grow really quickly. There's one year's growth. That's a redwood that we put out there and some giant sequoias. We put a pretty good mix of plants out there. And um, normally we have some kind of mortality for some reason or another. And so 20% is kind of like a figure that you're basically going to lose, sometimes less, sometimes more. But so replanting is, is something, is a feature of these. And when you're planting one and or fund or doing the, the budget for one maintenance and replanting is a very important part of this it's something that again we learned over the years when we weren't doing this in the beginning and we didn't have the resources to go back out and it's really important to be able to stick with them um, mulching is is really important when i we we just started doing this recently on just about every hedgerow we do, you can get all different kinds of mulch from uh, landfills. There's ones that are available for organic farms, the, the agricultural um, mulch they use, and it keeps the moisture in, it smothers the weeds. I mean, you get some weeds, but they come out and it's a very, very good thing to do. And it gets biological activity going around the base of the plants. Um, here's a hedgerow on a strawberry field, just kind of showing how fast the, these hedgerows can develop and grow. This is that same hedgerow two, three years later. So uh, to me, this is a, just a great example of a hedgerow. It's, it's, the plants just take off, and I think that's one of the 
One of the things about these plantings is nature and the biological processes are the real stars of these things to see the plants. You know, we were working with native plants in our ecosystems. And if you can get them going, we'd like to get them irrigated for about three years is ideal. If we have any kind of normal weather patterns that after that, you really don't have to do much. You see, there's not going to be a lot of weed pressures here. You won't have to irrigate them. So it's just getting them off to a good start and um, taking care of them in the beginning. Um, here's a hedgerow in the Salinas Valley that actually, I, this, was, this is an example of a hedgerow. You know, nothing is perfect. And this one has been there for a long time. And we did several of them with Eric Brennan down at the USDA Research Center. And the farmer on the left had issues with birds this year because Eric in the past had planted mustard cover crop there on the right and the white crown sparrows need the some amino acid that's in the mustard to molt and so it the birds had never really been a problem but this year he didn't plant mustard he planted another one and the birds went over into this field on the left and and pretty much took a pretty serious percentage of, of a broccoli planting and so it just shows that there's there's so many factors in this, like crop selection and um, just working with neighbors too. It's like a lot of the farmers will have learned that there's certain things that they cannot plant next to these because there's, there's bird issues or other kinds of issues, but that doesn't stop them from doing the hedgerows or wanting them. That's just it's like anything in farming. You have to make adjustments and you learn and um, you're always going to lose something, but you can just decide to do different crops near plants that are sensitive to it. So um, I think it's a good example of just being adaptable and not just saying, okay, that's it. I'm never going to do a hedgerow. That's, that's really not the way to think about it. Um, hedgerows also provide dust. This was over in Madera, Tom Willie's farm, where trucks and cars go by and dust would just come on his field. So we put a hedger up there that really is effective in keeping the dust plus the uh, beneficial insects that he would get off it. This beautiful red plant in the front is a California fuchsia, which is a nice plant to add. We get, you know, it's nice to have plants with tall, medium, and short. And again, looking at how fast this thing, this plant planting developed is really something that was just a few years old. This was a planting on a vineyard where they wanted a barrier to the neighbors. Um, berms are a really good um, area for a hedgerow. Many farms will have a, a short berm where you've got something just like here. And so putting in some of these short varieties of plants, I'm just, this, uh, these plants on the right here are short coyote brush. There's a short buckwheat. There's um, yarrow is one. This is pretty much, that's a picture of the same berm when uh, a year later with a yarrow, real different colored yarrows really took over. But this had been a weed issue for the farmer. And instead of that, he replaced annual weeds, which are actually Rachel Long has shown are really high in pest insects with... Um, these native plants, which bring in a lot more beneficials. Um, here's uh, something we use is creeping wild dry. We planted as an understory plant. To, this was actually a, a bed that had a lot of thistles and hemlock and um, the creeping wild dry was very effective in, in keeping that out as an understory. This was done with three lines of drip tape Alyssum is commonly used. We've done this where it, it actually smothers weeds, it reseeds, and um, the plants do fine. We're planting these one gallon shrubs, and so the alyssum doesn't really hold them back at all. Weed cloth is another technique you can use. We've used squares around plants, or um, we haven't really done this. This is, was a picture taken up at Lockford at the NRCS uh, Plant Materials Center there, but it is a way to do it if. You know, uh, we try to stay away from using fabric and having plastic out in the environment. But nevertheless, it, in some cases, it can work and it's good. Um, solarizing beds. 
Um, this was a Tom Willys. We saw that before, but he took, th this is in the hot Central Valley. He took three drip lines and ran them down the field and then put this, this um, plastic over it. And that was in June and ran it all summer long. And then um, in August and July, we did the planting. You can see this big cluster of weeds in the front. That whole bed would have looked like that. And this, the solarization worked very well. And again, this is on an organic farm where, you know, he wasn't able to use herbicides. Um, just some pictures of mulch. This was eucalyptus mulch, which is actually a very good mulch. It, people think it's allelopathic and it might be for some seedlings, but for these shrubs, it, it's very good. And it's pretty accessible. Lots of eucalyptus around. Um, and I'm, the next slide is going to be a picture of this hedgerow with the eucalyptus mulch. And the plants did very, very well there. Um, and the weed pressure was very low. So we've pretty much tried to use mulch all the time now. And um, it's a great, great thing to work with. It just it, it brings life to the soil. Um, this was one we did down in Salinas Valley. We put the hedgerow out and then we put buckets over it and had this semi come in with and just drive along and drop the mulch along and it actually the buckets did a very good job in protecting it then we raked it out this is how not to do it this was a planting in watsonville where the just the operator wasn't really paying attention and so we basically had to crawl on top of this and pull all the mulch off the plants it was kind of it was all right they all lived but it wasn't ideal for sure. Um, this was a, is a pomegranate hedgerow Dale Cope put in over in San Juan Batista and um, it, and there's a lissom down at the bottom too on a bed inside. But um, this just kind of is an indicator of various other types of plants that can be used in hedgerows. It doesn't always have to be native plants or you know, the ones that we've been using. I mean, a farmer, it's his farm. He has the ability to use whatever he wants. And some farmers want some kind of economic return. So pomegranate, there's persimmon, mulberry, citrus, pineapple, guava, uh, these herbs, rosemary, lavender. Lavender is a great pollinator plant for bees. Um, medicinal and culinary plants. They can be low. They can be shrubs and also ornamental for cut flowers and foliage and even trees for structural and fuel wood. So this is just a different kind of uh, plants that you can use on these hedgerows. Windbreaks, we, we try to use, we get away from the eucalyptus and the casserina. We used redwood. This is at Phil Foster's farm and they did quite well. Actually the plant down the front of the bottom slide is a California pepper, which is not a native tree. And it actually can be quite invasive in uh, Southern California, but it's an excellent tree. Uh, but we use redwood, giant sequoia, incense cedar. Um, there's uh, actually another non-native tree, soap bark tree is very good. So this was a little windbreak we put in a riparian area over in Hollister, and the next day we came over and there was an egret already checking it out. Um, and there's our pile of mulch up there on the side that we used to mulch this. Um, this was in over in Hollister at uh, a pretty degraded site. It had a lot of trash and everything. It's right on San Benito River. And so the farmer took 30 feet out this slide right in the middle here, and we put a uh, riparian trees along the edge and then a line of shrubs on the inside. Um, and those trees did very well. They got irrigated well in 11 months. The cottonwoods just took off. That's Michael Halperin with me there. And again, this is a really good planting. That's the same planting two years later. Um, it's always really great to see how these plants get established and take off and you know like i said before the the growth the way that they just do grow is just always so rewarding when and the farmers have a huge part in this you know if they pay attention to it, it, it we try to think of it as another crop it's 
it's easy to put this thing in and then forget about it. And that's when we have problems. It's you really, until it gets on its own and gets going, you've got to think of it almost as a crop and pay attention to it. Ponds can be put in. NRCS has lots of information on this. This is three ponds, but kind of shows a successional movement of them. And um, this pond was actually in the Central Valley and he ended up, this was in the middle of nowhere and he just started putting ponds in and ended up getting a river otters and all kinds of interesting things come in. So again, you create this habitat, you're going to get life. And that's, that's why a lot of farmers do this. I always ask farmers, you know, what, are you having problems? What do you think of this? And, you know, a lot of them really like it and they come back and they do more of them. And it, it, it just widens your life when you're a farmer, you have more to, it brings in more things. And since sometimes farming can be really, it's hard and it can be really boring. And so it's kind of fun to have new things here. Um, ladybugs, we're going to talk about insects now for a little while. Um, ladybugs are good. That's a coyote brush on the left. Deer grass is a great plant. It's a native. It grows in wet areas, but it will grow in wider, in drier areas. And it has spiders and ladybugs. Uh, Rachel Long has done a lot of work with this. Uh, she's a farm advisor in Yolo County, and she has some publication there in California Agriculture. And the plant species that she sampled, there are there on the left, the ceanothus, the buckwheat, coffeeberry, coyote brush, toyon, and elderberry. And then she monitored for these beneficial insects, and she's done studies on um, the movement of these insects into the field. She's got a recent article down here on the bottom of the slide in California Agriculture. Um, I have a list of references at the end that you can access when it's when you if you are able to go f see this after the slide is over. This just shows some plants in other parts of the of the country. We've done um, presentations in the East Coast, and so I call people up there and get them to send me names of plants, but you can find similar types of plants all through the United States. This is the, some of the East Coast plants because we did some in down in Arizona and they have, they, we've done, they're doing hedgerows down there, New Mexico. Um, the pest insects, this is um, just some of the common pests that can be controlled or at least the, the beneficial insects work on the wasps. Uh, that's aphid mummies there up there on the right. Wasps lay their eggs on aphids. Um, various ladybugs, spiders, nabid flies. The surfid fly up there on the left top is the backbone of the, of the organic romaine and lettuce uh, industry. Lacewing larvae, lacewings, assassin beetles, nabid, all kinds of things in the Wasps lay their eggs like on a caterpillar head there, and they're very effective. A lot of these wasps are tiny. You think of wasps as this bigger thing, but there's many, many species of wasps out there. Um, this was some work done by Tara pisani Guerrero up at UC on some of the hedgerows we did. And this is an important slide because it shows on the right, there's six species of plants. and um, if you have the diversity of plants, then you get a diversity of insects coming in. And so this shows wasps that were found on these plants but from June through October. And so because there was a variety of plants, she got a lot <clears throat> more uh, insects. This is the same thing with here, the green lacewing study. So if there was just one species there, you wouldn't get any anywhere near the kind of diversity. And also diversity of plants give you success. A lot of times some plants just won't respond to a, a situation. And if you have a lot, then, you know, you at least get some growth and get some success. Um, alyssum, as I mentioned before, is used to bring in a lot of surfid flies and other beneficials. And here it's being used on lakeside organic farms, you know, planted throughout the farm. And if you've got perennial habitat, which actually we do on this farm, it doesn't show in this slide, but um, the insects will live throughout the year in the perennials and then they go out into the field and the certain, and the alyssum is a way to pull them into the fields. So again, a lettuce field using the alyssum. And they've 
train their farm workers to not weed it out when they see it. And so it kind of naturalizes in the field and, and spreads the, its power to attract insects throughout the field. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about owl boxes are used to bring in owls, which are good for gophers and some other animals. This is Steve Simmons, who was at Merced High, and he would collect old raisin drying plywood, and the kids would build in his shop class, they would build owl boxes and um, sell them and build a scholarship fund up. He was great. He really really publicized the use of owls and owl boxes. And so we were on this field day and he crawls up this ladder and pulls an owl out of the box. And then over on the right, he pulls these two little baby owls. And then here on the bottom, there's a gopher. So he had the whole menu in that one box and it was really amazing to see. And a lot of times you look underneath an owl box, you'll see the owl pellets. Birds, um, they can be a problem, but they can also be very good on a farm in the turn of the century they had the universities had department of economic ornithology and people would would send birds over there and they'd cut open their stomachs and different species of birds eat different types of insects but birds are tremendous insect eaters um so it's something that you see a lot of birds in 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 these hedgerows they bring birds in um Bees, pollination, there's a lot of interest and activity around pollinators right now, and Xerces Society is a great resource for that. This is a black sage that just attracts lots of bees. Bees are great for, we all know, increasing yields. There's tons of information out there about that, but most of the plants that we use do attract bees. Coyote brush, for example, when we planted coyote brush in uh, Madeira, we went out there in November and there's male and female. The males have the pollen. A couple of those plants were so covered with bees that you couldn't even see the leaves on them. And um, this it's actually this hedgerow right here. And the bee, the farmer hire, uh, pays to have the bee, the beehives there. And um, he also had a, I think it was a pomegranate nursery that also attracted bees. It was either pomegranate or persimmon. But in any case, there were so many bees coming into the hedgerow and this that the, the beekeeper reduced the charge to this farmer and he saved $8,000 in one year by having the hedgerow that had so many bees on it. So it's kind of, that was a really interesting economic angle to this, but it just shows that, and in our hedgerow manual, we have a column there that shows which of those plants attract bees and so actually most of them do. Xerces and others have lists of plants that attract that are pollinator plants and the internet is a great source for that but so it's a great feature of what we're doing is um, bringing in pollinators. Um, issues and problems this is you know not there's no silver bullets nothing's perfect and um i did talk before about that the birds eating the broccoli seedlings um they can bring in pests insects rodents and birds there's food safety concerns i'm going to talk about that in a minute um the issue of how far do the insects move into the fields uh, genetic pollution where you're using native plants that might hybridize with rare and endangered native plants. So it's, it's really good to be aware of that. It's a very, not a very common issue at all, but some of the ceanothus is some, in some cases will, you know, are so rare they don't want other ones around that might hybridize with them. There's diseases associated with these sometimes like this eutypa is a disease in vineyards that ceanothus is a host for. So we'll never plant ceanothus in a vineyard. Um, and then the maintenance issue is always an issue. Um, so these are some food safety slides. Um, this spinach was in the field when that 2006 spinach outbreak happened and the spinach never got harvested. And it was not that there was any issues in the um, hedgerow or anything, or the area, it was just, there was, they told everybody to quit buying and selling spinach. And um, 
There's a lot of research going on on this. Um, the Wild Farm Alliance has done a lot. CAF, Kathy Carlson, um, you can reach her at uh, Kathy at CAF.org, is the food safety person working with that for CAF. Um, and here's just some things. This is a really s simplistic snapshot of it, but just factors to be considered when deciding if animals are a food safety concern, um, the number of animals, this is like the number of deer or, or ground squirrels or something like that, the number of them, the type of them, the type of crop that you're growing. Some crops, you know, it's not an issue at all. Harvest procedure, like is it mechanically harvested so that some mice or frogs or something could get into the, into the harvest? Um, neighboring influences, is there a cattle ranch right next door, a chicken farm or something? Pathogens of concern, there's lots of pathogens, um, or lots, well, there's some, and there's E. coli and salmonella and various other ones. So, you know, additional processing, is the, is the product gonna be put in big tubs of water where it can mix with others? So there's lots of considerations. But the important thing that's developed since 2006, and there was initial like knee-jerk reactions and everything, is now people are really looking at the crop, not the habitat planting. I mean, not to, you're not going to look at the habitat planting, but if there's any kind of crop damage or animal feces in the crop, that's when that real action, because we know the habitat is going to have wildlife, as we've seen here. It's, it is there. Um, so anyhow, um, I think it's good for a farm to have a, a food safety plan, and I think talking to Kathy about that is a really good idea. And a lot of it's about marketing. The auditors and the buyers, some of them are not really – um, knowledgeable about all the processes that go into farming and so they need to be educated and um, so but I think we're dealing with a lot of farmers who who do grow for various markets who are still able to do these habitat plantings and so um, I think it's important to just be knowledgeable and learn about it um, the habitat does bring in animals here's a tree frog in a hedgerow. There's a gopher snake in a hedgerow. I like to show these slides about snakes actually catch rodents. They, um, a lot of the farm workers are just kill snakes and we try to always teach them, you know, snakes are okay. And this is a slide of a, a rattlesnake actually at Sequoia National Park grabbing a ground squirrel in our campsite right in front of us. This snake just crawled in the hole, pulls the squirrel out, just starts eating it. You can see down there at the right. And um, not that we're going to get rattlesnakes, but um, it's just good to remember that, you know, there is this balance in life and snakes are good. You don't want them in your salad mix, but nevertheless, they're good. Um, this is John Anderson with a gopher snake up in his, one of his plantings up in Yolo. And these are some of the, the, practices that are used to minimize the food safety issues. This is, these are these fences they put up, like silk fences, they sometimes call them frog fences. And, you know, they look like they could possibly be effective and they're, they make people think that you're doing something. This is a, a fence around a hedgerow that we planted. Um, just examples of that chicken wire, really tight chicken wire. Here's a, up on the left, there's a fence alongside of this grass planting. And so now I'm going to talk about um, grasses. This is, um, this is a great example of two scenarios for a ditch. On the one side, that's creeping wild rye that was, that was broadcast seeded on the left. And on the right is a pretty problematic eroding ditch without any cover. Erosion is a huge problem in some of our farms and areas. But this is a good slide showing how perennial grasses develop these, these great root systems, like six feet on this one perennial grass on the left versus an annual there on the right. Um, this was a pond that was eroding and muddy, and we, we did just a broadcast seeding and irrigated it. And these are perennial grasses got established there. Here's a Pretty easy way to do it. You you uh, put out the grass seed, lay straw on it, and drip tape, and it comes up with um, nice grasses. You do get some weeds sometimes. 
It's just a picture of John Anderson's production field. He grows these large areas of grasses, and that's where we get a lot of our seed from, our native seed. Um, this is a vineyard in, in Watsonville, the slide. You can see that we, we contract with nurseries on these plugs up in the left. You can get them for like 20, 25 cents a piece. On the right is this road that was, we tried seeding it and it just didn't work. So we just said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna plug it. So we put this drip, this uh, sprinkler system down and on the right, you can see how it just really turned into a nice grassed road. It took a lot of work. It wasn't cheap, but it, it, this farmer wanted no water coming off his farm, no erosion. And so we did it. Um, this was a steep strawberry field and we uh, broadcast the seed, put out straw. We put right, we use rice straw, which doesn't have weed seeds in it for our area and um, irrigated it 50, about 50 bales per acre and uh, came up and you do get weeds. You have to walk through and knock them out or weed eat them or mow them. If you can keep weeds from going to seed, most annual weeds will not continue to reseed. They're, they're very short lived actually. If you just keep them from going to seed, you can really control the weeds. Just a situation here where between two fields, we just put a bunch of different types of grasses. And this is when you plant plugs. It's kind of labor intensive to put them in. You do them one at a time, but then that's what it ends up looking like. On the left is what it looked like before. Made a ditch on the right, and then six months later is what it is on the left there. That's the Salinas Valley. This is at the U USDA Spence research plot there on Spence Road in Salinas with Michael Kahn. We did this one where we made a wider ditch. So the ditch shape is really important. If it's a V shape, the water tends to go faster. If you can make a U shaped or a wide ditch, you get better retention. But this was done by just broadcasting the seed, putting drip out. Then again, we put the, the rice straw on top and it's come up to be a really, really nice planting. They had to do a lot of weeding on this, but um, after a while, the, the actually the grasses will start to choke out the weeds. And if, as I said before, if you can keep them from going to seed. This was uh, in Watsonville where they were gonna put a $30,000 pipe in on the left. We did grasses and yarrow and this huge rainstorm. This was planted in March, so it was able to grow and get irrigated for nine months. A huge storm came in on the 1st of January and I thought it was gonna get wiped out. I went out the next day and that's what it looked like. The grasses were just great in, in holding that soil and preventing the erosion. So these things really do work, but they need, they need to be really taken care of to get in there. This was a road in, over there in Hollister where the farmer was getting erosion and runoff from this highway. And we went in, we did two things here. We did plugs, which you can see here. We also did, we tried some sod that Delta bluegrass is growing some native sod. It's kind of expensive, but we, so we just did a hundred feet of that and we did 700 feet of plugs and um, for the same price. And it's really a nice planting. That's it today. It's doing very well and did totally solved the problem that he had. He, he was really concerned. He was getting big erosion channels in his, in his fields. Um, just another example of grasses being used. Uh, Rami Shidahe down at the RCD in Salinas put this weir in on one, which is, is just a piece of sheet metal with a couple of two by fours. And what it does is slows the flow down and gives the water a chance to, to percolate and come in. And it, it was really a neat technique and very, co very cost effective. Just another example of a filter strip. Here's a couple of shots of different kinds of filter strips. This was a, down at the bottom of a strawberry field that was just next to a creek where it was just total sand pit. I almost got stuck down here just driving along. And again, just getting this thing established, we threw out the seed. We put straw on top of it and irrigated it, and then it came up as a very nice stand. So these things can be established without plugs and just broadcasting the seed and just taking care of them. If you water them, they'll come up and take care of them. Here's some desert seeding that Steve Lehman was doing some down in Kern County uh, before this was not irrigated, before the rains. And then they would just 
really have some remarkable success in doing it. So just to show that these habitat plantings can be done in a whole variety of situations. Deer grass is a, is a phenomenal plant that can be used in all kinds of things. This here was used as a border. It's a great plant. There's actually a rest stop on Highway 5 where they've put thousands of them in. It's really interesting to see. And But I see them, I see deer grass in all kinds of different places. And we try to use it in almost every one of our plantings. Um, just a shot of, you know, a nice vegetated ditch between two fields that keeps the vegetation there, creates habitat for wildlife. This slide was taken these from the exact same spot. Looking, the one on the left is looking down, and the, the one on the right is well, actually it's looking up, and the one on the right is looking down. And it just shows how vegetation can really help control erosion. This is um, shrubs and grasses, and there's also one of those silt fences along the back for a food safety issue. But um, Willow trees are another thing that we use a lot. This is a pretty bad eroding ditch in, in Watsonville, and we went in and put willow stakes in. And um, this did not get irrigated. It got in before the winter. And then um, these trees can get really big, and the way this farmer manages this is to actually go in and prune them every year but it's it's definitely done the job for him he really likes it here's another area where the farmer was putting concrete blocks and everything in the corner and we went in and put willow stakes in there and um and the willows have really helped hold the hold this bank um, this is a picture up at John Anderson's farm. If you, This picture was taken again from the very same place, looking downstream is what most of the ditches look like up there. And looking upstream, he uh, has put all kinds of uh, riparian vegetation in there. So it's just a good shot of creating habitat. So again, to kind of wrapping up this show here, we've got Going back to the hedgerows, I always like this picture because it just shows a, a, a big area that where you've got a lot of um, vegetation as part of the environment. This is an aerial shot of the Salinas Valley. There's not a whole lot there. Um, but here's this Alba farms in the middle of the Salinas Valley and some of the hedgerows that we've planted over the years have kind of could be a model for for various farm situations. This is a slide that probably you want might, if you're interested, you might want to look at. Or you know, you can call me or email me. My uh, I'll give my information. Um, but there's so many types of research could be done on this. Um, on these habitat issues, the functions of them, the different ways of establishment, the different problems and issues, and um, there's just infinite numbers of infinite areas for future research can be can be done, and you know, using graduate students and uh, whatever. So it's just we do not, you know, we do not know everything about this by a long shot, and I keep learning. You know, I think so different species, different insects, different insect behavior, what species of plants will coordinate with which specific crops, um, just all kinds of interesting things can be researched. Um, one of the things just ending on here is uh, the work we've done with school kids. Um, we, we've, on some of our projects, we wrote in having school kids come out to the farm and help plant and the farmers sometimes would go into the, the classroom and give them a little presentation and it's really great getting kids out you've probably all heard of this nature deficit disorder where kids are all sitting in front of their computers and all the lizards and snakes and everything populations are rebounding because the kids aren't out in the woods chasing them around but um it's just amazing working with these kids they really love it 
and they do a good job and it just I think, you know, it's the future to be able to do it. And I think there's some real funding opportunities there to link up habitat plantings with educating, with educational programs. So I think it's something to really keep in mind. Um, just a couple of resource pages here. Again, I think you'll probably be able to pull this off when, when this is on the CAF website, but Bob Bug and has been very influential. The CAF Hedgerow Manual, Rachel Long is doing great work on this. Um, Paul Robbins and others wrote this Bring Farm Ledges Back to Life back in 2001, which has a whole different kinds of plantings from the Yellow. This is available from Yellow RCD, a very good manual to have. And these are just some grass references. There's a lot of issues on, you know, how much does grad, these grass plantings actually reduce sediments and can they catch pesticides and things like that. And so there's a lot of work being done on this. And this is just a list of things that I've put together on that. So to end here, uh, my information is there. You feel free to call me anytime. I'm actually a TSP with, with NRCS in case, you know, that works out with any of the equipped projects or other projects. And my uh, email address is hedgerows at baymoon.com. And then CAF, as I said, CAF has a lot of information on this and so the Wild Farm Alliance as well. So that is pretty much it. And I, I want to, again, acknowledge all the people that have worked with us on this. It's not been a one-person show by any means. It, uh, the farmers have been great and all the agriculture professionals who've been positive. It's really, it's a it's a great thing to be able to do, I think. So So now I think we can move on to questions. So um, feel free to submit them using the question box on the right-hand side, and we'll um, take about 10 or 15 minutes to run through some of these questions. So let's start with one of the earlier ones about irrigation. So Sam, about how long um, should irrigation be put on seedlings to really establish a hedgerow? Well, you know, there's no one answer to that. If you're, what we usually do is, um, in general, we try to irrigate for three years, but when you put a planting in, you want to keep it wet. I mean, that's pretty much, you don't want it to totally dry out. And you don't, obviously overwatering can be a, an issue, but basically just keep it wet. And then the mulch helps keeping it wet. And whether you, it depends on your weather, it depends on your area, but you know, you whether you run it a couple hours, a couple days a week, but you just go out and monitor it. And when it starts to, and drying down is okay because the roots, you know, that makes them work, but drying out is not okay. So basically the answer to that is just keep, keep it wet. Great. So there was another question when you were mentioning um, plants to maybe avoid planting in certain scenarios. So can you explain and repeat why you wouldn't recommend using Ceanothus in vineyard settings? Well, Ceanothus is a host for this, I think it's a virus, Eutypa, which is, can be very serious in grapes. And um, so you just don't want to plant a plant that's going to harbor, that's going to be an overwintering host for, for an insect or, or a disease. So it's, you know, there's a few of those things out there. There's it's okay to have a few of the plants, but you know, some of the ones that we've heard of is that we do hear of is um, Toyon, for example, can be a, ho it's in the rose family and it can be a host for fire blight and um, fire blight can be an issue with pears and apples. So, but some farmers have like Phil Foster has Toyon in his hedgerows and he's got a lot of apples and he just monitors that when he's, we don't have, obviously you don't have a whole row of toyon but there's a few there when he sees it he cuts it out and but it's something i if there's an apple orchard i will avoid planting toyon it's that kind of a thing you want to and there's things you just need to learn about that there's there's various plants associated with pierce's disease in vineyards um we've recently heard that coffee berry can be a host of white fly in certain areas but Again, a few coffee berries is okay because coffee berry brings in a lot of beneficial insects. So there's always a balance there. So you just don't want to overload your, if you're in an area of that, you don't want to overload it with coffee berry. 
Okay. So there's been a couple of questions about if the presentation will be archived. Um, this presentation has been recorded and we will put it up on our CAP website in this next week and we'll figure out how to email it to you all if you want to check it out for future reference. So there is another question in terms of mulching and weeding. Um, so maybe you can explain a little bit more about um, the, the benefits and the minuses of using mulch to control weeds. Well, um, okay. Well, I just see Rex's comment about mulch does sometimes have to be reapplied in spaces and can be expensive labor-wise. All of that is true. And we, I mean, I just totally agree with this comment. I mean, it's, but like, it's, you know, it's, these things do take work. It's not like you just put them out and walk away from them. So, um, the, the alternative to mulching is you have to go in and either hand weed or if it's not an organic farm, apply pesticides, I mean, or herbicides. So weeds are a huge issue in this. You can't let the weeds override these plantings. And, but the great thing about them is once they get going, the weeds will actually smother out. I mean, the plants will actually smother out the weeds. So the weeding pressure becomes much less over the years. Um, okay, the comment, you have high cost of hedgerows under problems. I think you're expensive considering increase in multi. Well, I think, you know, actually Rachel Long is doing some research on this. So that, you know, you've, you've heard the term ecosystem services. And um, we have heard of farmers, you know, anecdotally saying that because of having a diverse habitat, they've had to reduce their their pesticide use. Um, we've seen that actually in nurseries and some farms. Um, the ecosystem services of pollination or, you know, how do you quantify that? Um, and then soil erosion, you know, if you have a field that ends up out in the road and you have to take all the soil back out onto the farm if you're controlling that. So, um, yeah, it's, it, there, it's not, quantified that well but it's it's kind of common sense that a lot of these things do pay in their own way ecosystem services is a very you know important concept so there's a, a few more technical questions okay. um in terms of drip tape and then also more lists of plants um so what different types of irrigation have you used on these different hedgerow installations? Is it drip tape or do you use micro sprinklers? And how does that work on sandy soils? Well, we've used just about everything, but drip tape is the easiest and it works, it works well. I mean, sandy soils, you obviously have to pay more attention to how, where the water's going and how you're doing it. But, um, we, we've used all of those, but I've just found that, the drip tape. When we first were using emitters, we would put an emitter on either side of the plant so that if there was some kind of movement of the tape, it would cover it. But with this uh, inline, we don't do that. But you just have to monitor it. But um, yeah. So another specific plant question is um, if there's a list of species that should be avoided for specific crops in terms of native planting for hedgerows. Well, there's not really a list. It's pretty much the ones that I've mentioned. Um, the the vineyard people had there's lists in the in the vineyard literature about which ones to avoid for Pierce's disease. Um, like I said, the ones that I'm most familiar with are Ceanothus in vineyards, Toyon around apple and pear orchards, and just recently finding out about coffee bear, which is one of my favorite hedgerow plants. You know. It's a host for whitefly in certain areas, like evidently in the Napa Valley right now, in certain parts of the Napa Valley, it's really associated with this whitefly. So, I, you know, I think that's just, that's something that more, much more research needs to be done with. So I, I think we have time for that's one more good, question. Yeah, so good, do you have any suggestions for planting on sites which are not tilled or disked first? That's a, that's a great question. Um, Yes, you just act as if it is tilled or disc. You dig a hole and make sure you try to plant 
up on a mound, like we think of planting on a reverse coffee, think of a reverse coffee cup. You don't want to plant down in a basin, but if you just, if you have to, you just, with your shovel, you just dig a hole or, you know, we, in a really hard soil, you can use a post hole digger on a tractor. But um, yeah, the shovel, just making a nice, good hole and putting compost in it and, and taking care of it is, is the way to go there. Great. So I think this is going to conclude our webinar. Again, this is going to be archived and available on the CAF website at www.caf.org. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Sam, for sharing all your experiences with us. We'll keep you posted on any future webinars we have on this topic. Thank you and have a great day.